with something that I am sure I don't need to belabor with you, which is why do we care about bumblebees? And, and the reason is pollination, right? And uh, I don't, I would be surprised if people in this room were not already aware of how profoundly important pollination services are to ecosystems. As a quick refresher, pollination is how plants have sex, right? So without the services of pollinators delivering male gametes to female gametes on flowers, then over 80% of the angiosperms that exist on our planet today would die out, right? So we're going to go with profoundly important. Um, pollinators come in all shapes and sizes. You have birds, bats, uh, butterflies, this guy will be something, um, and bees, and flies, and beetles. But bees are a huge component of pollination services, and particularly bumblebees. Um, bumblebees tend to be kind of what we call cornerstone species in ecosystems because they're really good at manipulating multiple types of flowers. So we all know the story of Darwin's orchid in Madagascar, where he found a beautiful orchid with a long spur and hypothesized there must be a moth out there that's made just for this flower, a match made in evolution. And, and they found that hawk moth, it was a, it was a spingidae moth. And, um, and that's great, but that moth is only ever going to pollinate that one flower. Right? Bumblebees are so profoundly important because they can pollinate all kinds of floral morphologies. So when you have a type of flower, which say maybe due to climate change, their one special pollinator is out there, doesn't, doesn't find them, the bumblebees can often step in and take over those pollination services. This phenomenon is not unique to natural ecosystems. It's an important component of agricultural ecosystems as well. So insect pollinators contribute <coughs> billions of dollars in pollination services to our agricultural industry. And bumblebees are an increasing percentage of that as honeybees are suffering under colony collapse disorder. Unfortunately, bumblebees are also crashing. And this is a phenomenon that is less publicized than honeybee phenomenon. So I'm going to show you some somewhat upsetting data that was published in 2011. And before I show you these maps, I wanted to explain the metrics of data. Okay, so you're going to see maps of the USA, and they're going to be shaded from light to dark. Um, areas that are dark, uh, computational models based on prior um, surveys indicate that you should have a high percentage of bees in that area. So if it's dark, you should expect to find that species of bumblebee. If it's light, it didn't live there. Okay? Um, the size of the circle is a measure of how intensely that area was sampled. And then the percentage of that circle that is orange rather than yellow is how many bees actually were found. So if we see an area that is dark with a big circle and is yellow, that's a sign that we've suffered a significant decline in populations. Okay, well, so let's see what we have. A lot of big yellow circles. A lot of big yellow circles. So on the left-hand side, you're looking at one of the classic bees on the west, western part of our country, Bombus occidentalis. Um, you can see a lot of them if you go to Grand Teton National Park. They're really cute with little white fuzzy butts flying all over. Um, but in, in general, their populations are declining. On the right-hand side, we have the bumblebee named after our state, um, Bombus pennsylvanicus. And uh, uh, you can't find it in our state. It's gone. This trend is really broad. It's not just a couple species. It's an enormous number of species. One could even say the majority of bumblebee species. There are a few that are actually improving. So Bombus mafarius and Bombus impatiens are more generalists. They're, they're a broader class of generalists than these other bumblebee species. They're kind of like the pigeons of the and so where these other bumblebees are dying out, there are a limited number of species that are, are flourishing and coming in and taking their place. But as we know, that's not a long-term solution, right? Because systems thrive on biodiversity. Because systems experience change, and diversity is what imbues a system with the ability to respond to change. Um, so this is upsetting, right? Uh, and, and that leads us as scientists to say, well, why? Why is this happening? Um, and before we kind of really go into that question, I want to tell you a little bit about how bumblebees live. Because their life history makes them particularly vulnerable to changes in resource acquisition. So unlike honeybees, which, where queens live for multiple 
seasons, and the bees are kind of awake through the winter, the workers heat the hive, and they store all that honey, so they have food to eat all winter long. Bumblebees are annual, right? So it starts off with a diapaused queen. That's phase one. Or something. Okay. Um, I sometimes I forget what's my next slide. Uh, so you start off with a diapaused queen. So you have a mated queen, and she's sleeping, and you'll see queens kind of getting ready to go underground about now. Um, and in the spring, she'll come out. So I don't know if you've ever noticed that the first bees you see in spring are gigantic. They're huge. Well, that's because those first bees you see in the spring are those queens coming out. And they dig a nest. They locate a nest site. And they forage and rear the first brood. So the queens are out in the early spring gathering nectar, gathering pollen, and they're building up their first brood. Once that first brood emerges and they can take over the work of foraging, the queen retires to a life of egg laying. Um, and over the course of the summer, this process iterates. So the queen continues to rear subsequent broods, and those workers go out and forage, and they come back. And the more foragers you have, the more food comes back into the hive. Now here's an interesting thing. I'm going to cast back to this first slide in an obnoxious and long way. Okay, we're looking here at the same species of bee, right? The difference between these two bees is the amount of food they got as babies. So as you go through the season, those first bees are itty bitty, and then they get a little bigger, they get a little bigger, and you'll notice through the season that bumblebees will get larger and larger and larger, and that's because as we step through this iterative process, their sisters are able to bring them more resources. When it's getting towards winter time and you hit a, a size threshold, that colony will then produce reproductive. It will produce fertile males and fertile females, and those animals will leave the hive, they mate, and then everybody but the mated queens dies. And the mated queens go off and find a nice place to hibernate over winter. So why are they vulnerable to resource acquisition? Well, here's a really badly made figure that I did not make. That tells me how. Um, okay, so on your x-axis you have, it's just because it's really bad colors, colors don't come as well. Uh, the colony size on your x-axis, and then number of colonies on your y-axis, so that's a proxy for frequency, right? How common that size colony is. Okay, that we can follow. Um, the kind of sort of paler box is colonies that produce no reproductives. The, so those are these boxes here. The hashed boxes, are colonies that produce only males. Males are less expensive. Fertile males are less expensive. And then the dark filled boxes are the colonies that were able to produce queens and males. And if we step back and we look, you only see black over here. So there's a really strong effect of colony size on ability to produce reproductives. Okay? So only if you have enough resources to rear enough bees, to bring enough food into the hive, can you successfully make a queen. And what that means is you have one season where you don't get enough food, local population crash, right? It's not like, oh, we're a little small now, we'll recover next spring. There won't be a next spring. There won't be queens. They will not have been made, so they can't go into hibernation, so they can't come out the next spring. So the life history of bumblebees makes them really, really vulnerable to changes in resource acquisition. <coughs> so if we use that lens to think about what is causing population declines, we can come up with a pretty ready list. Is it parasitic infections? Sure, those are bad for you. Uh, is it bacterial disease loads? Sure, also bad for you. And it's coming in from uh, agricultural bumblebees being imported from outside of the country. Is it pesticide exposure? Well, this is bolded because this is one that you're seeing in the news a lot lately. There's a particular class of pesticides sides called neonicotinoids that are having profoundly uh, troubling effects on bumblebees. So neonicotinoid pesticides were found um, in Science and Nature, there were a couple really good studies that came out a few years ago, to lower foraging efficiency. Okay? Not only do they lower foraging efficiency, they reduce the number of queens produced. So you can see this direct correlation between the foraging data and the reproductive data. So you have a massive drop if you treat colonies with even a little bit of neonicotinoids. And this was, I mean, this was a study that was done at field realistic levels. 
These were um, hundreds of colonies foraging on fields in France. It's not a lab study where they treated fields with field relevant levels of neonicotinoid pesticides. So this is mimicking a real world situation. And in that situation, you see this tanking of your queen production. Another thing that could be causing declines, or it could be exacerbating declines, I should say at this point in the presentation, that there's pretty good consensus in the bumblebee research community that this is our biggest problem right now. In the context of that, how do we reduce stressors on the few queens that are left? What are other things that are providing stress on the system, creating stress? Habitat fragmentation is certainly going to be one of them, um, because bumblebees will have to travel farther to get to resources, and so more of the food that they're collecting is getting burned out and transported rather than being brought back to the hive. It could also be harder to find that. Um, it's a question I'm profoundly interested in, but I'm not talking to you about today. <laughs> uh, what I am going to talk to you about today is uh, some of the earliest work I did at Muhlenberg, which is looking at some, oh, I lost my category. Oh, it's on the thing. Um, <laughs> little scattering. Uh, which is, what are the indirect effects of agrochemicals on bumblebee behavior? So we tend to think about um, kill bees bad, right? Which I agree with, like, killing bees bad. Um, but what about agrochemicals that don't kill bees? Mm -hmm. Now, when we think about finding resources, particularly in the context of an animal that travels up to one and a half kilometers away from its hive to find food, how does it find that food? Well, one of the tactics it might be using is odor. So we can think about, um, forgive the really bad animation that's not good. We can think about uh, what's a classic rheotactic behavior, where an animal flying in the world encounters an odor plume, and when it does, it's like, oh, hey, sweet odor. And then when it crosses out of the plume, it turns to re-encounter the plume. And when it crosses out, it turns to re-encounter. And you get this casting behavior of the plume. This behavior is really well described in multiple species. Um, it has been shown that bumblebees will fly in a wind tunnel, so it's likely they're also using these odor cues to navigate. Okay, so that's piece A. <clears throat> piece B is what are we hoping that these animals are going to use their antennae to find? Now, on this slide are two of my absolute favorite summer foods, tomatoes and blueberries. Now, bumblebees are spectacular tomato pollinators. When they pollinate tomatoes, tomatoes, you get more of them, and they are bigger. And it's because they're beefy, and then they vibrate the thoraxes to fly, it buzzes. And that buzzing uh, has a really positive effect on shaking loose pollen. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons they're really effective. Now, let's look at these plot plants. Tomatoes get sick. We all lost our tomato crop several years ago, right? And this entire area was wiped clean with blight, which is a fungal disease. Blueberries also get fungal diseases. You're looking at a close-up of bumblebee, of uh, bumblebee, blueberries with a uh, leaf spot mold. Now, um, what do you do when your plants get sick? If you're a farmer and your livelihood depends on the health of those plants, you treat them, right? You treat them with fungicide. So this is a, a bag of manzate, which is an agro, which is an industrial uh, agrochemical fungicide. And if you look at the instructions, they recommend that you apply this anywhere between every four to seven days for pretty much every crop that's grown in this region. Now, you can also think about the fact that tomatoes are really nitrogen hungry, right? Like they use a lot of nutrients. And so you will probably throw fertilizer if this is your livelihood. Now, I want to say right now that farmers are smart people. They are better at growing things than I am. If my livelihood depended on my ability to garden, my children would have started it years ago. I am excellent at killing everything I put in my vegetable garden, right? And, and these people feed me a beautiful bag of vegetables from really smart farmers. And so they're not going to put pesticide on a blooming tomato plant when they're looking for a pollinator. But you might not think twice about putting fertilizer on there. You might not think twice about putting a fungicide on there. That's not a pesticide. And I've got to take care of my plants. Well, the question becomes, what do these chemicals do to the odor signal? So here we're coming back to that indirect effect of agrochemicals. We're not necessarily looking at the direct physiological impact on these animals, but how are we modifying the sensory processing, which is really kind of where my heart lies, is in understanding animal behavior, and I tend to do that from a lens of neurophology. How does the brain perceive signals, and how does that modify behavior? So this is what I started doing when I got at Miller. Um, essentially asking what are the behavioral effects of agrochemical contamination. The 
first question that we asked was, do agrochemicals modify bumblebee ability to locate resources using olfactory cues? All right. <clears throat> so how do we do this? Um, we buy bumblebees on the internet at bugsorbees.com. <laughs> and uh, we glue them to a Tupperware box. And, uh, and to that Tupperware box, we glue a duct fan and a big old greenhouse charcoal filter. And that fan pulls air out, and then the carbon trap on it will pull any volatile chemicals off of it. So nothing that we're ever treating gets dumped into the lab. Onto this antechamber, we put a foraging chamber. And that foraging chamber has a carbon filtered air inlet, so it pulls any volatiles from the room in. So we've got a lot of control. You're getting clean air in the space. Uh, and then we put a feeder, and on top of the feeder, we can send a filter feeder. Okay. So this means that bumblebees that walk out of their hive are going to be exposed to an air plume that's meandering from the chamber over into here. So while they're walking around that antechamber, they should be like, oh, hey, there's odor over there. I can go over it and I can find the feeder. At that point, we then watch the bees, and by we, I mean my honor student, um, and she <laughs> slept in the lab. Um, so she watched and she said, okay, I will consider a bee that visits the feeder three times within five days to have made the association, a Pavlovian style association. Pavlov's dog learned to associate the bell with food. We're teaching these bees to associate a scent with food. Then we pop that single foraging chamber off, we take that bee who knows what it's doing, and we put it in a maze, and we say, go, be free, try and find your food. And we mark two different variables. Can they find the correct chamber on their first try, and how long does it take them to get to the feeder period? We then repeat this with several agrochemical contaminants. So one treatment we used was turf builder, which is a, a commercial, like available to all of you, herbicide and fertilizer. And uh, the other was a, the, a fungicide mandate. So this was giving us kind of the scope of non-pesticide agrochemicals. So the animals are then required to run the maze against a background of agrochemical odor. And I know that the feeder is in the same chamber every time, but when we actually ran the experiments, we did randomize this. All right, so what do we find? On your x-axis here, we have our control conditions. So this is bees running in an unpolluted maze. Our turf builder conditions, this is bees running through a fertilizer maze. Uh, and our mandate condition, this is bees running through a fungicide maze. Okay. Then you have percent correct choice. Now with four chambers, as we all know, our chance of being correct uh, is 25%. So if we're not using any sensory cues or we didn't learn the food, then we'd be 25% right. Our controls are 90% right. So this is really comforting because it aligns with other papers that have done similar odor navigation experiments. They were seeing their controls at like 88, 92%. So like, sweet, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Turf builder, 90%. Oh, interesting. Mandate, 60%. That data is very interesting. So all of these are come out as statistically better than chance. So all of the bees are capable of fighting the feeder. But that mandate data is interesting. If statistically we say, based on the literature and the known ability of these bees, we expect the bees to be 90% efficient, 90% effective at finding the feeders, we see a significant decrease in ability. So the mandate, they're better than chance, but they're worse than the controls. And if we look at the time to feeder, this effect becomes much more dramatic. So again, same x-axis. On the y-axis, you have time to feed her in minutes. Now, I imagine you're sitting there thinking, well, of course, because they didn't find it as often. So you have all those trials in there where they were walking around to the wrong chambers. Those trials were excluded from this. These are only the trials where bees went to the correct chamber on the first try. And when you exclude those incorrect choices for all bees from the analysis, you drop a full level of significance. You go from a p of less than 0.01 to a p of 0.001. So it's a real phenomenon of the bees just moving slowly and qualitatively, they appear to be more distressed. They stop, they spin around, they you know, try and get out of the tubes. They just look more agitated when they're exposed to the mandate. <coughs> so that first set of experiments told us that mandate negatively impacts bombus and patients' olfactory navigation performance. We felt pretty comfortable with that. But what I was less comfortable with was how forced the situation is, 
right? So, I mean, basically, we'd take the bees and we'd put them in the maze and be like, do something. And if it didn't do it after five minutes, we'd be like, done with you. I'm going to get another bee. Do something, right? And there's not a lot of choice involved there. And that's not particularly realistic. So the question becomes, what role does preference play? And here's where the animation gets really ridiculous. So the question is, I'll, I'll just try and spare you as much as I can spare you on that. Um, the question is, as a bee is wandering around in a complex environment where some people are using fertilizer, some people aren't using fertilizer, some people have fungicide, others don't, do the bees care? Do they just keep going no matter what? Right? So in this situation, that bee was like, yeah, cool, fungicide's fine, fertilizer's fine, I don't really care. Or do the bees actively avoid, whoa, why I'm surprised. Or do the bees actively avoid these contaminated patches? And do they selectively navigate past the contaminated patch to an uncontaminated patch? So in other words, do they care? And how does that play out in a behavior? So to answer this question, we trained the bees the exact same way. And then, instead of running them in a maze, we took off the one chamber and we gave them two. And there was a feeder in that chamber. They could go anywhere they want. And what we would do is, on a control day, both those chambers would be unpolluted. And we would show up every 15 minutes, and we would count the number of bees on the feeder. So in this context, we're comparing a non-polluted box to a non-polluted box. We would expect a 50-50 distribution. We then carefully go through and pollute one of the boxes, randomly, and go and count every 15 minutes how many bees are on the feeder. And we did this for both Mansate and Turf Builder. So here are the data we got. Now, I know this looks like a hot mess of ones, but there's a reason. The reason is that day to day, the number of bees that choose to come out is incredibly variable. So if I put up a bar graph here and put on standard deviations, you'd be like, what? So instead, every single day is graphed as its own line. Because the statistical analysis we're doing here is uh, similar to a paired t-test. We're comparing within day. On Tuesday, did they prefer one side? On Wednesday, did they prefer one side? So the absolute number of bees is way less important than the relationship of the sides to each other. So each day is its own line. Where you see a solid line, you have a decrease from the control to the treatment. Where you see a dashed line, you have an increase from the control to the treatment. So, in the control situation where you have unpolluted versus unpolluted, we would expect to see a similar number of solid and dashed lines, which we do. Okay. Now, the turf builder had no impact on our navigation performance. So walking in, we're like, well, it doesn't affect our ability to find the food. We might expect to see a 50-50 distribution of solid and dashed lines, but we don't we have a significant number of solid lines. And that tells us that the bees are actively preferring an unpolluted chamber, even if it's, a ch if it's a contaminant that does not by their ability to perceive or use that odor signal. And somewhat expect, and we expected this piece of data. But for the mandate, we also see far more solid lines than we do dashed lines. And again, a significant avoidance of the contaminated chamber. This data was troubling because it said that bumblebees are less likely to feed in an environment with agrochemical contamination, right? And so even if it's not bothering them, they're still avoiding it. Um, so what we've found is that agrochemicals are likely modifying foraging patterns. Now, as we try and transition this work to the field, it's not easy. All of this was done with boxes in a lab, like sterilized shoe boxes from um, I'm very good science. Um, and so the question becomes not, not only like how do we move forward into the field, but kind of how can we integrate our work with the community? Um, and so I am here to talk to you about my work, but also kind of where I'm going right now, which is really trying to figure out what a bumblebee is actually doing in the wild. So before I can look and say, how are they using sensory signals? There's not a lot of data on what they actually do from a holistic perspective. There's a lot of neuroethology data on how they behave in a lab, and there's a lot of ecology data that goes out and counts them in a field. There's not a lot of linking them. 
And as we think about the environment we live in, it's incredibly fragmented. These animals need a lot of food. They're going to have to move patch to patch. And there's no data showing how they do it. There's like, it's not there. And so I spent the summer in Grand Teton National Park um, ostensibly doing a, a phenology study, but really just trying to get preliminary data so that I can get money from NSF to start looking at how bees are navigating, what sensory cues they're using. But in order to do that, we really just like, we need methods to figure out what they do. So we found, uh, kind of, we started to hone in on the best way to monitor them in the field. Which means, and it's pretty simple, um, stand, it turns out standing and monitoring a constant patch is not the way to do it. That's a great way to get bitten by mosquitoes and be really bored. Um, what is an effective way of doing is walking. So we discovered that our walking surveys are not only more entertaining for us, but you encounter more bees. And so you basically you go out, you walk, you take notes on what kind of bees you see. This is work that anybody can do, right? Particularly in our area. Grand Teton National Park, you've got 13 different species of bumblebees. IDing them on the fly is not very easy. <laughs> uh, in this area, if you stop and look at flowers in a garden, which is 80% you know, chance what you'll see me doing when I'm walking down the road, people think I'm crazy. They'll be walking down the uh, but if you do that, and you double back, and you find a plant, and you see a bee, 98% chance you are looking at one of these three bees. You have three choices. One of them is small and is a honeybee. When you look at this, you can see the colors are a little clearer, they're much smaller, and they're not fuzzy. So you can say, that's not a bumblebee. Check. These two look kind of alike. The one on the left is a bumblebee. It's a bombus impatiens. I have seen one time I have seen a not bombus impatiens in this area in nine years. Almost guaranteed, if you see a bumblebee, it's a bombus impatiens. This is a carpenter bee. These look really, really similar, right? The coloring is the same. Um, this one's a little darker. They've both got the black spot on the thorax. You think, how can I possibly tell them apart? This one has a fuzzy abdomen. This one is perfectly smooth and shiny, shiny, shiny. If it is a shiny abdomen, it is not a bumblebee. So within five minutes, you could teach your students how to successfully identify bumblebees. With that ability, you can have them doing foraging surveys. Where do you see bumblebees? How many do you see and what plants are they on? What could this data be used for? A lot of really useful things. You can look at effects of patch size. Is there a difference in how many bees you see on one plant in a front garden or on a huge meadow that is right by the school? Right? My husband um, works at Deer High School, so he's in an area where fragmentation is really profound. Um, so you could look at effects of patch size, effects of fragmentation, in other words, looking at is distance to the next patch a factor in how many bees you see. You can look at abundance data. How many bumblebees do we have in the Lehigh Valley? And finally, I think the best way to be doing this, and I have a student who's going to be working on this this summer, <laughs> is um, integrating field ecology with and like the uh, kind of consumer engineer, right? There's been an enormous uh, explosion in amazing technology you can build on your own for less than 50 bucks. Uh, we built multiple monitored, automatic monitored feeding stations for the Tetons with a $30 Arduino and a $15 kit that added some environmental monitoring to it, and then like a $20 SD shield, less than $100 per kit. Right? And then some upside down buckets because duct tape time. Um, so now you can get these wearable platforms. So for $30 from, or from Adafruit, you can get uh, an Adafruit Flora, which can be programmed with Arduino code and it can have a GPS unit. And you can add a microphone and an SD, a micro SD card. And as you're walking around, you can literally be tracking exactly where somebody is exactly how fast they walk. And this is going to solve the past problems of 15 pollinator observer minutes. How fast do people walk? How long did they watch that be? You'll have that data because you will have the GPS. You can talk into the microphone and take notes as you go, then take those GPS tracks and go back and get rigorous data on the plant. What species was it? How many blooms were there? How many were in senescence? How many were budded? This is the kind of data you can get when you're meandering through a field without the wearable technology. And so 
there's a real opportunity to introduce high school students, undergraduate students, even middle school students if somebody else builds the technology. Although, you know, arguably, if you spend an entire winter building it, you can have it ready to roll out in the spring. To kind of integrate these very different fields of field ecology and emerging engineering. Um, so, I did pass out my brand new business cards that I got this week. Um, this is something I'm really doing, and this is something I'm really interested in doing. So, if there are local teachers that are interested in doing pollinator survey work, please email me, look me up. Um, I won't respond for at least three weeks because it's an ad right now. But after three weeks, I would totally respond. <laughs> uh, and the last thing I have to say, I do track time, I hope I'm not over, is, um, is that it takes a village. So I say I a lot, and uh, as a PI, an undergraduate institution, there, a lot of the ideas are, are my own, but they, they don't happen just with me. I have had an enormously fantastic population of students that have come through my lab and been a part of my lab. I've mentored over 30 undergraduates in my nine years here. And uh, Caitlin Ritter at the top collected all the data you saw today. Most of, she collected all the maze data. Um, and she was helped by other students with the choice data. Um, she spent 20 plus hours a week in the lab, which is incredibly unusual for an undergraduate student. She wrote all of her other papers in the lab, did all of her other homework in the lab. Um, she probably ate in the lab, but she's not allowed to. Uh, <laughs> uh, Eric Quitter uh, graduated in the spring, and I miss him desperately. Uh, my 20 hours a week in the lab these days show me how much I relied on him without realizing it. Uh, and then my current crop of students, Sarah Cass and Roma, Alex Marsky, and Bottle, are, are fantastic students up and coming. Um, so, and I, and I do need to thank the Lumber College for their financial support of this work. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. Thank you.